the mechanism of, of natural selection for evolution. And, and basically we just concentrated on, um, on Darwin. So one little piece of evidence that is a modern type of evidence is bacteria and viruses that evolve quite rapidly. So for example, I think I have this later anyway, but I'll just show you here. These are bacteria and they each have a gene at one position, but this is a different allele for that gene. This is an allele that confers resistance. And then along comes an antibiotic which wipes out, this is a very, very simple way that I'm doing it, but wipes out some of the bacteria. Uh, but this one, it just keeps dividing by binary fission. And all of the offspring have this allele. So I'm simplifying it a little bit because um, bacteria have many different alleles, some which may confer a little bit of resistance, some which may confer a lot of resistance. And that's why when you get antibiotics for a bacterial uh, infection that you have to take the entire dose because you really want to get rid of all of the, the bacteria, any that are a little bit resistant. So in this case up here, we had one in seven a one in seven frequency of this allele. And now we have, what is one in seven when it comes to uh, um, percentages? Can someone please divide seven into one? <laughs> Let me know what that is. One seventh. 40. Sorry? 14. 14, 14%. Okay, so 14%. And now we have 100% of individuals that have the round, red round allele. And that is an example of microevolution. It just occurs from one generation to the next. So this theory of evolution, it provides a pretty good cohesive explanation for many kinds of observations in nature. So that was one observation that we can see that's happening currently is that allele frequencies do change from generation to generation. One of those um, instances is something known as homology. Homology is a similarity in structures arising from common ancestry. So structures arise from common ancestors. And they may or may not have the same function. Um, quite often they do not have the same function. So here's an example of homologous structures between organisms. Their anatomical resemblances. Here are four mammals. And we know that all mammals have a common ancestor. And the most basic feature of a common ancestor that all mammals have inherited are mammary glands and hair. So we know that whoever our ancestor was uh, millions of years ago, it was an ancestor that had mammary glands and hair. So these are the homologous structures. 
this structure here is the radius. So you can see the radius in a human. You can see a radius in a cat. You can see a radius in a whale, although it's shorter and squatter. And you can see the radius in a bat. So the, the function is slightly different. It's, it's uh, all locomotion, but the style of locomotion is different. And for humans, um, it's the movement of the arm. So it's more of a locomotion using the arms. For cats, it's locomotion for uh, jumping and walking. For whales, it's locomotion for swimming through water. And for bats, it's locomotion in the air. But it's a homologous structure. And another one is the ulna. Again, in the whale, it's very small. It's very squat, but wide. And the bat, it's quite thin. So there's variation in that structure. Those are homologies, anatomical homologies. We could also look at comparative embryology, which reveals homologies that are not visible in the adult. And nowadays, with the technology that we have, we can use um, we can use um, electronic microscopes. We can use even compound microscopes. And we can see various structures like pharyngeal pouches, for example, and the postanal tail. This is a human embryo. And this is a chick embryo. We both have pharyngeal pouches and we both have postanal tails as embryos. But as adults, uh, humans do not have either. And as adults, the chickens do not have either. So these are homologies at an embryonic stage. And evolving from a common ancestor explains having those homologies. Evolving from a common ancestor. And vestigial organs are really intriguing homologous structures. They're remnants of structures that served important functions in the organism's ancestor, but no longer do. So why should they be present? Vestigial organs. Well, let's see. What kinds of vestigial organs do we have? The tailbone. The tailbone, yeah. The appendix. The appendix is another one. Yeah, we have a third eye. We don't have a third eye anymore, but we do have the remnants of a third eye in the corner. It's what's left over. And there's a what few muscles. The that we have. Oh, sorry. Uh, what was the appendix for? Uh, um, what was it for originally? Originally. Um, I'm not sure, but I think it had something to do with digesting cellulose. Yeah. So we don't digest cellulose anymore. We can't digest it anymore, but our ancestors could. Uh, what else? Palmaris muscles? And some of said, it, sorry, uh, I should have said third eyelid. It's not the third eye. Okay. <laughs> some of us have, I, I don't know if this is a vestigial um, trade, but some of us have um, the, um, the toe, um, the toes attached to each other. Not all of them, but in some cases they are, um, the term escapes me uh, when Webbed? they are, say it again. Webbed? Yes. I don't know if that's a vestigial form, a uh, vestigial trait, but. Um, 
It is not. I think that having webbing just means that that tissue was not, um, it did not go through apoptosis. So during development, some cells die because they're um, programmed to do so. So as an embryo, we all have webs between our, our toes and between our fingers, but those cells go through programmed cell death, it's called. So I think that if you have webbing uh, when an individual is born, it just means that that process hasn't been completed. Okay. Yeah, but I'm not sure why exactly. It's probably an anomaly uh, during development. But it could be that our ancestors had webbed feet. Yeah, so this concept of the evolutionary tree of life explains homologies that we've observed. And what we could observe before there was DNA analysis were anatomical resemblances among species. Um, they're reflected in molecules, genes, and gene products. So for example, this is a human hemoglobin. which is a protein. And proteins are all made of amino acids and a particular sequence. Coded for by DNA. So we can see that we can, we can, um, we don't sequence it in the same way, but you can sequence amino acids by their size and see how similar they are between different species. So between humans and humans, our hemoglobin is all the same. Between humans and the rhesus monkey, the sequence of amino acids is 95% similar. Uh, between humans and a mouse, the sequence of amino acids is 87% similar. Between uh, humans and a chicken, 69%, a frog, 54%, and a lamprey, which is a more ancient kind of fish, 14%. So you can start to build uh, phylogenetic trees this way as well. So Darwin observed also that the geographic distribution of species or biogeography bio formed an important part of the theory of evolution. And so even though um, organisms may have evolved independently from different ancestors, they have evolved very similar structures because of the uh, pressure of natural selection. So for example, in Australia, it's really common between Australia and the rest of the world because Australian mammals are marsupial. So they had a marsupial ancestor and North American mammals are placental. So they had placental ancestors. Yeah, but they're very similar. They have a webbing between their front and back legs. And here the flying squirrels have webbing between their front and back legs. So um, they both live in forests and it's an adaptation to move through the forest without um, without fear of predation for the most part and to get to new food sources. So the adaptation is a membrane between front and back limbs for gliding in forested land, forested area, to both avoid predation and find food, new sources of food. And both of these things, predation and finding food, those are uh, 
selective pressures. So the, the feature of having a membrane between the front and back limbs is adaptive to the environment. And evolution explains very nicely the fossil record. Yeah, it's consistent with, consistent with other inferences about the major branches of descent in the tree of life. So if there are transitions between um, ancestors and descendants, you would expect you would find some of those transitions in the fossil record. And there are some fossils that have transitional forms. So this animal has um, vestigial limbs. That was a precursor to an aquatic mammal like a whale, not showing any limbs at all. So these types of organisms have been found. But you can't always find the transitional fossil form. Those fossils really don't form all that readily. So what is theoretical about this uh, view of life, evolution? Well, sci in science, a theory is a little bit different than a layperson might use the word theory to be the same as a hypothesis. But a theory accounts for loads of observations and data and integrates a great variety of phenomena. In our case, integrating embryology, um, morphology, fossil record, molecular analysis, Uh, sorry, I <laughs> just had a problem with my computer there for a second. Yeah. So evolution by natural selection integrates these diverse areas of biological studies, and it, it does stimulate a lot of new research questions, for sure. Yeah. So there is still a lot of research to be done. Um, there's a lot of research going on right here in British Columbia on the three spine stickleback. That's very cool. And there's still work being done on the Galapagos Islands. Very interesting. So I'd like to stop there for now. That completes this lecture.